11 is where we're going to begin our reading. It says, Wherefore remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. This is Paul talking to the Gentiles. Notice he, he doesn't sugarcoat it, but he throws out just how bleak the situation was pre-Calvary. He says, you were Gentiles. You had no hope and you had no God in this world. What a terrible place to be in. Amen. But the fact of the matter is, is that's us that he's talking to. He's talking to the Gentiles. He's talking to those that are not of the bloodline and covenant of Abraham. But thank God he doesn't stop there with no hope and without God. But he said, but now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Jesus. Can you say thank God for that? Amen. For he is our peace who hath made us both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even which, which means the deep-rooted hatred, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you, which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. I want to call your attention back to verse number 14. When he said, for he, talking about Christ, is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. I want to preach if the Lord will help us. For just a few moments on this all tear down this wall. Tear down this wall. Father, I pray that you add your blessings to the reading of God's word. I need your anointing even now. I'm tired in body, but I feel you in my spirit. Do a work in hearts and lives. God, let us not just preach your word, but let us receive and respond to the spoken word of God tonight. Do a work around these altars. We pray for all of these needs that we've made known. Father, you know about them all. Pray that you do a work in hearts and lives. We're going to be careful to give you the honor, the glory, and the praise in advance for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray it. And the church says amen. amen. And amen. After World War II, Berlin, the capital of Germany, was divided. It was one city but it was governed by two different forms of, uh, of, of governance and a governing structure. The Soviet Union, after the fall of Adolf Hitler and after the fall of the Nazi Party, when they uh, secured uh, Berlin and Germany in 1945, the Soviets, they took the east part of the city and the allies, which were the United States and Britain, they took the west. And they coexisted that way for 16 years. But in 1961, at the height of the Cold War, when the United States and, and Russia were at each other's throats and were really at the height of, of all-out nuclear war between the two countries, the Soviet Union erected a wall down the middle of Berlin. It started overnight. The original barrier consisted of cold barbed wire and a few concrete bricks, but it didn't take long for that wall to expand. This wall ran 96 miles in length, around 27 miles of uh, the city of Berlin. And the two walls, it was actually, the, it's referred to as the Berlin Wall, but if you study it out, it was actually two different walls. There was a one wall that was erected, in between it was what was called a death strip, which was 160 feet wide that was full of fine gravel and sand. And then uh, in that uh, death strip, uh, there were landmines that were planted. There was 
uh, dog runs where they would release dogs on it. So if anybody tried to escape the wall to go from East Germany to West Germany, they would be killed. Some 327 people died trying to flee communist Soviet Union on the east side of the city to get to the free democratic portion in the west side of the city. On top of the wall was some 320 watchtowers where uh, communist soldiers would sit there with spotlights and binoculars and they would look for people that would try to scale the wall. There were actually some attempts to go under the wall and that 160 foot death strip, the reason that they used the fine sand and the gravel was every morning the commanding officer would inspect the gravel and the sand. And if there were footprints in the sand, then that was a testimony that the watchman was not doing their job and they would be punished and imprisoned because they let those immigrants uh, escape and, and go through the wall. And so that's uh, the, the history of the Berlin Wall, of why it was erected and, and how treacherous it was. But uh, it was built in 1961, but in 1987, we had a president with a backbone of steel that on a, a European trip, he wasn't even supposed to, to go to Berlin. He was going to Italy to an economic conference, but made a last I say a last minute decision. My last, uh, the, the weeks preceding to the trip said, we're going to go to Berlin and we're going to stand at the wall and we're going to deliver a speech right to Mr. Gorbachev, who was the commander of the Soviet Union. So a few weeks before the, the trip, the, there is a, an advancement team that anytime the president goes to a city or a location, they go in advance to secure the perimeter, to, to, to secure the zone, to, to scout out, to make sure that he's going to be safe. But on this trip, he sent a speech writer. And he said, I want you to go perform some, uh, some intelligence for me. And he said, I don't want you to tell me what the people are saying about this wall. I don't want to trust on ambassadors. I don't want to trust on, on people in positions of power. But I, I want to hear what the people are saying. So the first person that he talked to, he, he asked me, he said, what are your thoughts about this wall? He said, the president's going to be coming. He's going to deliver a speech. And he said, I, I want to know what your thoughts are. And the guy told him, he said, I would encourage the president to not push this matter too hard. He said, the wall has become a normal part of our life. He said, for our young people, he said, this divided uh, city is all that they've ever known. He said, we have built our wall or built our life around the walls. And he said, I think it just needs to stay as is. So the speech writer was scratching his head. He was puzzled and said, that's really not the answer that I thought that I would get. So he found another a, a couple, an elderly couple. And he asked him, he said, what do you think about the wall? He said, I just talked to another gentleman and he told me that uh, I, we should leave it alone, that the wall has become normal to them. And the, the older gentleman had tears welled up in his eyes. And he said, for 20 years, my sister has lived on the other side of the wall. He said, I have not been able to see my sister. I have not been able to talk to my sister. I've not been able to hug my sister in 20 long years. He said, there is nothing normal about this wall. And he said, I'm not going to build my life around this wall. The speechwriter had every bit of ammunition that he needed. He went back to the White House and he began crafting a, a speech. And there was a lot of back and forth. I was studying this out in the airport today. There's a lot of... Uh, of history about the back and forth, the, the, the U.S. government, uh, the, the, the um, CIA, the FBI, the, the different entities of government did not want Reagan to make this speech and definitely did not want him to call out Gorbachev. But when he heard the words of the speechwriter and he heard the words of, of that older German couple, Reagan vetoed them all. 
and said, I'm going and I'm going to deliver this speech. And so he penned the words. He said, behind me stands a wall that encircles the free sectors of this city. Uh, a part of a vast system of barriers that divides the entire continent of Europe. He says, standing up before this gate, every man is a German separated from his fellow man. Every man is a Berliner forced to look upon a scar. And as long as this gate is closed, as long as this wall is permitted to stand, it's not the German question alone that remains open, but the question of freedom for all mankind. He said, Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you speak prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. And Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Tear down this wall. Now, looking back in history, that is one of the top ten speeches given by a president in rating scales as they have uh, rated foreign policy in the history of U.S. presidents. And then a man that had a backbone that looked at a wall that divided a nation that really divided the world between democracy and communism, between government control and freedom. He looked at it and said for the wall to come down. Two years later in 1989, the Berlin Wall come crashing down which was a symbolic act of the collapse of the Soviet Union. And one of the greatest foreign uh, relations policies of Mr. Reagan came to be. This was a date marked in history. Amen. Where freedom prevailed, families were united, a country was reborn, and evil was defeated. Some of you remember that day very well. I was a whopping uh, uh, one year old when it come down, so I can't rightly say that I remember it, but I've listened to the speech many times. I've seen the videos as families crossed over that wall, begin to cry and weep and embrace each other and love each other for the first time in 20 years. What? A miraculous uh, and what a momentous day. Uh, amen. But as I begin to think about our text, uh, as, uh, as uh, much of a dividing line as the Berlin Wall was for Germany uh, between communism uh, and democracy, uh, there was a wall that was far greater. Amen. There was a wall that was far greater. And there, this wall can be viewed two different ways. The first way I'll call the wall of segregation. As Paul was writing to the church of Ephesians, he started by talking about Jews and Gentiles. He said in our text that there was a wall of partition that divided them. Partition in the Greek means a hedge or a fence, but it also has another meaning. He said that fence which separates and prevents two from ever coming together. This wall of partition built up between the Jews and the Gentiles. Amen. We know that it was erected in Solomon's temple. Even going back to the tabernacle of, uh, uh, of Solomon and, uh, and the tabernacle of Moses, there was an outer court through which the Gentiles could come and they could congregate around. And when I say Gentiles, those were any outside of the bloodline of Abraham that was God's chosen people, the Jewish nation or people. Any other nation, they could come and they could congregate on the outside of the temple. But there was what was referred to as the wall of the Gentiles, which was as far as they could go. The only way that you could go past that wall was if you were of the bloodline of Abraham and if you were of the Jewish faith. And that wall, when it was built, it was built as a preventative that would ever keep the two sides from coming together. When it was built and that wall of the Gentiles was erected, amen, there was no intention of a Gentile ever stepping foot into the tabernacle 
tabernacle. Uh, it was built uh, uh, to, to keep uh, us, to keep the Gentiles out. Uh, and there was no hope uh, for ever reconciling the two races. Uh, but can I tell you when Jesus Christ, uh, hallelujah, came uh, and died on the cross of Calvary. Uh, and man, Paul says uh, he dealt with that wall. Yes. Hallelujah. He looked at a wall uh, that separated uh, a man bond and free. He looked at a wall uh, that kept the Jewish nation in uh, and the Gentile nation out. Uh, and he looked at that wall uh, and he uh, evaluated that wall and he said, it's time uh, to tear down this wall. Uh, it's time uh, for this wall of partition to come down uh, and for these people to be made one. Hallelujah. So that uh, was what Christ come to do on the cross of Calvary. He broke down the middle wall of segregation that forever a man would be eradicated to separate Jew and Gentile. Amen. When it says he broke it down, in the Greek it means he destroyed it, he dissolved it, or he rendered it effectively useless. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Not only did he tear down the wall, Brother Clint, uh, but he destroyed the wall. Uh, amen. And he destroyed it so fiercely uh, that nobody would ever be able to erect another one uh, in his place. Uh, to where now, uh, when we stand before God Almighty, uh, we don't stand before him as Jews and Gentiles. Uh, we don't stand before him uh, as proselytes. Uh, we don't stand before him as circumcised or uncircumcised. Uh, but we all stand before him uh, as one people, as one nation. Amen. The ground is level at the cross of Calvary. Hallelujah. Amen. To where we now have access because the wall of segregation has been broken down. Amen. The Gentiles had no access and no right to God because they were not of the lineage of Abraham. Oh, but on the cross of Calvary. Jesus tore down that wall. I know we're not running the pews and the aisles and shouting tonight, but we should be. Because now you and I have the ability to be saved. Now you and I have the ability to be grafted in. Now you and I have the ability to be born again. You see, we take for granted sometimes our salvation. But previously, we had no right to salvation. We had no right to this freedom, this liberty, because we were not of the chosen bloodline. Oh, but Christ did away with all of that to where you and I can now come and then pass the court of the Gentiles right into the Holy of Holies. Amen. And we have just as much right as any Orthodox Jew to be there because Jesus Jesus tore down that wall. I like what John Wesley said. He said he tore down the physical wall. For in Christ we are all made one. He tore down the spiritual wall. And brought the far off Gentiles near. He tore down the legal wall. For he fulfilled the law in itself. And ended the reign of the Mosaic law. That separated Jews and Gentiles. No longer do we have to come to Jesus or, or come to God and offer a sacrificial lamb. I don't have to slit the throat of a bullock or a ram uh, or offer up some turtle doves, uh, amen, to give me access uh, to God the Father. No, Jesus Christ uh, was the supreme sacrifice, uh, amen, to where now uh, I don't have to come offering a goat. Uh, I just come offering myself. Uh, I don't have to come offering uh, a sacrifice made with hands, uh, but I can offer a sacrifice burnt uh, in my heart, uh, a sacrifice of praise, uh, amen, because Christ tore down that wall. He went on to say he took sinful Jews and sinful Gentiles and through his cross made a new man. For centuries God had kept Jews and Gentiles separated. And the Jews had taught that the only way a Gentile could be brought near to God was by becoming a Jew. But now love this. Now the truth was revealed that the cross of Christ condemns both Jews and Gentiles as sinners, but reconciles to God in one body, 
that believe on his name. I can tell you a lost Jew is just as much hell bound as a lost Gentile. Religiosity is not going to save them. Religiosity is not going to save us. The cross condemns us if we're outside of the household of faith. But I can tell you that same cross reconciles us. It makes us one. If we believe on the power of his name. And I can tell you folks, as great as it was for that wall of segregation to come down, there was one more wall that came down that was even better than that. You see, that Berlin Wall had two sides, two different walls erected. I can tell you this wall that he tore down also had two walls, two different sections. Number one, it was the wall of segregation. But number two, it was also the wall of separation. Because you see, not only were Gentiles segregated from the Jews, but we both were separated from the Father. You see, the Jews and Gentiles had more in common than what they thought. Meaning that those sacrifices were not going to save them. You see, when Adam fell in the garden in Genesis chapter number 3, he plunged all of men into sin. It didn't matter if you were black, white, red, or yellow. If you were Pakistani, Indian, Russian, or red-blooded American. We all were separated from the Father. When Adam sinned, he plunged all of man into a degenerate state. And all because of the sin of one, all were made to die in the death of sin. All but by the death of one, Jesus Christ, he reconciled us back to the Father. That ought to make you want to shout right there. Hallelujah. You see, that principle for Adam, it carried over even into the Old Testament Mosaic law. Because when God told Moses to construct the wilderness tabernacle, he told him, he said, you're going to build the outer court, the court of the Gentiles. You're going to, on the other side of that wall, you're going to erect the, the table or the altar you're going to erect that, uh, that laver where men can wash. He said on the other side of that, in the holy place, he said you're going to put in that golden candlestick, the showbread, the altar of incense. He said, but you're also going to erect the holiest of holies. And that is where my presence is going to abide. That's where you're going to build the Ark of the Covenant. You're going to sprinkle it with blood and my presence is going to sit on the mercy seat. Amen. And that's where the very presence of God would abide. But there was just one problem with that setup. Men could not get to the holy place. Men could not get to the holies of holies. On one day a year, the high priest would go in on the day of atonement and he would offer a sacrifice unto God and he would sprinkle blood on that mercy seat. But outside of that, nobody had access to the holies of holies. Nobody had access to the presence of God. Amen. They could smell the incense. They could smell the aroma. But that's as far as they would could go. Why? Because there was a veil. There was a wall that separated fallen man from a holy God. And it mattered not how many blood sacrifices they gave. It mattered not how many turtle doves they sacrificed. It mattered not how many times they went by the altar. How many times they washed at the labor. It mattered not how good they lived. They were forever separated from God. As far as they could get was that wall, that veil. The presence of God was just on the other side. The presence of God. God was just on 
dust uh, on the other side of the wall. Uh, but they were fallen and he was holy. Uh, and no matter what they did, uh, they could never measure up. Uh, they could never be good enough. Uh, they could never offer enough sacrifices uh, to reach the very presence of God. That was a wall of separation that separated a holy God from a fallen man. Sad. For 1,400 years, man was forever separated from God. For 1,400 years, both Jew and Gentile could not get into the holies of holies. They, 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 they heard the high priest talk about how good the presence of God felt. But it was just beyond their reach. It was just beyond their grasp. There was a wall that they could not get past. Oh, but can I tell you, Jesus not only removed the wall of segregation between Jew and Gentile. Thank God. He also dealt with the wall of separation that kept Paul and man from a holy God. Hallelujah. Amen. For the veil uh, served as a divider uh, for two reasons. It kept God's presence in uh, and it kept man's flesh out. Uh, but three of the four Gospels say uh, when Jesus Christ died on the cross uh, that He cried again with a loud voice uh, and He yielded up the ghost. Uh, and behold, yes. behold, yeah. the veil of the temple was rent in twain. Yeah. The veil of the temple uh, was dealt with. Uh, that wall uh, that separated me from God. Uh, that wall uh, that kept God's presence in uh, and my flesh out. Uh, Jesus said, not only am I going to deal with the segregation of people, uh, I'm going to deal with the separation between you uh, and me. Uh, and now, uh, hallelujah, Hebrews tell us uh, that we have boldness to enter into the holiest uh, by the blood of Jesus, uh, by a new and living way, hallelujah for which he hath consecrated unto us through the veil that is to say his flesh let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled and our bodies washed with pure water now I have access to the holy of holies what only one man, the high priest could go in and experience one day a year, I now can have 24-7 365 days a year because Jesus Christ tore down the wall of segregation and he dealt with the wall of our separation. Lift your hands and love him tonight. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're not just one. With the Jew and Gentile, but we made one with God Almighty. A fallen man now has access to the holy to the holy God. Hallelujah. In biblical days, men had no right to approach the king. The same way Gentiles had no right to approach God. That's why Esther, you read that story. When Mordecai I come to her and told her about the plight of the Jews, said, you've got to get a message to the king. She said, if I go into his chambers and I'm not invited, and I say one word that displeases him, he can lop my head off and have me killed. Mordecai, where were you? When he just abolished the last queen in power because she displeased him. If I say anything, it could cost me my life. Lord, okay, I said, we're going fast. For three days, we're going to call upon the name of God. We're going to eat nothing. We're going to have one agenda. We're going to get a hold of God. And you know that story, the story of Purim. How that God, uh, she gave him favor with the king. And God turned the tables on the devil. And instead of the Jews being annihilated, the Jews, uh, amen, God brought about elevation and promotion throughout the land. Uh, but on that principle, man had no right to the king. He had to be invited. The same way you and I had no right unto God. What is fallen man to approach a holy God? Who are we to bring a petition before God Almighty? 
as holy as he is, as righteous as he is, as godly as he is. Uh, amen. Who are we? Amen. To have any right to, to access the Father. I can tell you we have uh, no right in and of ourselves uh, to approach God Almighty. Uh, that's why uh, when we pray, uh, when we approach the King of Highfield God in this house, uh, the King of Kings uh, and the Lord of Lords, we say, Father, in the name of Jesus. I, I'm acknowledging I have no right to approach you. I'm acknowledging that I am a flesh and blood, but the blood of your Son has given me an access, given me a way to your holy place. I'm not coming to you in my name based on my credentials or my merits for what I've done, but I'm coming to you in the power of His name based upon the power of what He did on the cross of Calvary when He tore down the segregation and the Separation. He made a way through the veil that we may approach you and we are coming unto you in the name of your great son. That's why we open up every prayer with Father in the name of Jesus. And that's why we close every prayer with in Jesus' name we pray. At the beginning of that prayer, at the end of that prayer, we're acknowledging we're there based not upon our merits, but the merits of what Christ did at Calvary. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. I've got to hurry to a close tonight. Christ is our new and living way because of what Christ did on the cross of Calvary. We cannot go back to the Garden of Eden and have. Amen. That Adam. We can't have it and go back to that, that state of the Garden of Eden is fact nobody knows on the map where Eden is. Right. Has no clue. Right. Good luck trying to find the Garden of Eden. But by what Jesus Christ did at Calvary, I can experience what Adam yeah. experienced in the Garden. Yes. Oneness with God. Communion with God. Right. Fellowship with God. Listen, that's what he wants. That's why he tore down the wall of separation, of segregation. Amen. But the fact of the matter is, and I'm, I'm hurrying to a close with this. I've got more to preach, but I'm done. The Lord's blessed me. I guess the, the November, September, October, somewhere in that time frame. I traveled to Washington, D.C. for work. Thank God for connections and people and places that I'll never reach. I reach, there's a pastor over around the Brundage area. Uh, that I know of him, but his daughter is actually uh, the communications director for Senator Toberville. Helps write his speeches, helps do his social media campaigns, and uh, does a, a lot of work for him. And I just reached out to her and I said, hey, I said, I'm in D.C. I've got one day where my meetings wrap up early before I fly out and come home. I've been to the Capitol a couple of times, but is there any way that I can arrange a tour? Because they can give you personalized tours. And she said, yeah. She said, I'm not going to be in the office. She said, you come to the Russell Senate building. She said, I, you go through security, go to Senator Tuberville's office. There's going to be two guys there. They're going to take care of you. They're going to take you on a personal tour of the Capitol. Great. Thank you. Appreciate it. The night before, I had done a prayer walk around the White House, a prayer walk around the Capitol, a prayer walk around the Supreme Court. And if you've never walked that, folks, it's not just a hop, skip, and a jump between one and the other. I realized that I needed to do some pre-walking before I, I tried to do that. I prayed as much as I could and huffed and puffed the rest. <laughs> but what she didn't know, what they didn't know was while they were giving me a tour on the inside of that Capitol, I was hearing what they were saying with my ears, but subconsciously I was covering the U.S. Capitol with prayer. Praying. It's one thing to criticize them, and, and I can tell you, my philosophy outside of Senator Tucker, I'm just kidding. If they're up there, they need to come home. <laughs> What's going on and taking place is a disgrace. 
Senator Tuberville, if you listen, God bless you. Amen. But I was walking praying, God, would you spare this country? Would you do a work in us? Would you send revival? Revival is not going to come from the top down through government. But God, would you send a revival from a grassroots effort from the bottom up? Or fire would grip this. And, uh, we went on the floor of the Senate and got to, uh, got to sit there for a while. They were not in session, but just sitting where the senators sit and uh, hearing the history and subconsciously praying. The guy that was um, leading me on the tour was actually in a Presbyterian seminary. So a lot of the things that he was pointing out were faith-based things. And he said that there's, there's, when we were closing, he said, when we leave, he said, that there's one other place I want to take you. He said, to me, it's the, it don't mean a whole lot to anybody else, but to me, it's one of the coolest things here. And he took me to Statuary Hall. And in Statuary Hall, every state has the abilities to put two statues in the, the state capitol, in Statuary Hall or in surrounding rooms in the capitol. And for the, he led me to the state of California statue. And you would think that California being a liberal state, that their chosen statue would be of some liberal. But it's not. One of the two statues that they have chosen to place in the United States Capitol is one of Ronald Reagan. And he took me to the statue and he said, do you see anything that looks odd about the statue? And I said, well, the statue's bronze. He said, but this base... It doesn't look like the base of all the other statues here. He said, you're right. He said, all other stat statues, they're granite or some other thing. He said, but the, the base of Ronald Reagan's statue was actually built with portions of the Berlin Wall. Wow. He said, they brought pieces and chunks of that wall back. He said, they erected a base for that statue to sit on. And he said, this statue is forever a proclamation that Mr. Reagan brought the wall down. When I, when I heard that, I said, man, there is a message in that somewhere. I said, I don't know where it's at. But I began studying that thing out. God began burning in me. Amen. And on a plane somewhere between New York and Atlanta this morning, God told me, said, it's my will for the walls and my people's life to become statues. Not a wall is something that presently is that separates us, but a statue is a reminder of what was. A statue is a reminder not of what we is, but a symbolic picture of what was. You see, the devil would love nothing more but for you to be segregated and separated and he tries to build all kind of walls in your life. Amen. But I've come in the power of the Holy Ghost tonight. It's time to tear some walls down. Amen. I'm not just preaching to a house full of sinners. Amen. That's got walls of sin in their life. I'm preaching to some Christians that's got walls in their life that's damming up the flow of revival. That's keeping the river from flowing. God wants to deal with those walls just as much as he did the walls of segregation and separation. It's time for some walls to come down. It's time for the glory of God to be displayed. It's time for some walls to become statues. Not a visible reminder of what is, but is a re visible reminder of what was past tense. God has already dealt with the walls on His end. It's time for us to tear down the walls on our end. That Berlin Wall, those men and women, you go back and look at the videos and images some pulled out knives. Some pulled out hammers. Some pulled out sledgehammers and began to beat and beat and beat until the wall crumbled. But somebody got wise and stole some bulldozers from the Department of Transportation and began beating on the wall. Hallelujah. And it wasn't long until that wall that divided for years come crumbling down. I wish to God somebody would pull out some knives, some pickaxes, some sledgehammers hammers, some hammers and begin knocking down the walls of your life but maybe it's God's will for you to crank up, amen, a bull
bulldozer by the power of the Holy Ghost and say this thing ends tonight. I'm tired of being separated. I'm tired of this wall being in my life. I am going to tear this wall down. Stand with me all over the building. I'm done. Amen. How many Kirsten come help me? I'm through. How many of you will meet me in this altar tonight? Hallelujah. God's dealt with the wall of segregation between Jew and Gentile. God's dealt with the wall of separation that keeps you from Him. Amen. There may be some other walls in your life, but the same way those came down, it is God's will for yours to come down. Walls in your family. Walls in your church. Walls in your life. Walls that the devil has built for your destruction to be divisive. It's time for them to come down in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, lift up your hands tonight. Hallelujah. Amen spiritually it's time take some bulldozers take some sledgehammers but whatever you do leave here and turn your wall into a statue a reminder of what was not what is come on church